So praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. The Lord strengthens the hearts of the days. Make, he makes peace in your borders and fills you with the finest of wheat. The Lord sends forth the man to the earth. The word comes swiftly. The Lord gives snow like wool and scatters hoarfrost like the ashes. Cast forth eyes like morsels, and leave them to stand as cold. For the Lord sends forth the word and melts them, and makes the wind blow and the waters flow. The Lord has not dealt thus with any other nation, for they do not know God's ordinances. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us worship him in song. Our opening hymn today is All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Father, I thank you for all that you give us. From the simple things like giving us a guy that will take stuff to Santa Elena for us, to the beauty of the snow we had this week in the midst of your creation, to the sacrifice of your Son and the continual presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. As we give ourselves back to you, ourselves to glorify you, and to expand your kingdom. We ask these things in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now Don is going to come and do this in the
gone on before us this year. And if you are interested, we have a booklet with their name and biography in the back if you didn't get one. But what we'll do during this time is I will read their name and say just a little bit about them as we move forward. And then we'll go into our time of prayer and pray specifically for the saints and their families that are mourning their loss this year. A man that would have been weeping in heaven because of the Texas Tech score yesterday. <laughs> who had a quiet mouth of always words of wisdom. Dave Schweitzer. A man who served in many capacities from trustees and imagination station who never had a harsh word on his mouth, David Kaysen. The sister-in-law of one of our beloved, Harleen Parrish. Tragic loss of one of my staff members' sons, Kevin Lucas. Early death of the beloved Kathy Lane. man from Haskell, Texas, just 20 miles away from my hometown, that had a gentle, loving spirit that spent his last few years in his life, Daryl Roberson. And the woman who organized this event every year until this year, Maury St. John. to you, for all of the saints who have ever worshipped you, whether they were in brush or cathedrals, whether they were part of this congregation or not, where your name was lifted and adored, they were there. So for that, we give thanks to you, O oh God, for hands lifted in praise. Father, we pray that you would use those holy hands that have gone before us. That you would magnify our hearts now during this time. We thank you for the hard-working saints, whether they were hard-headed or still booted, whether their head was ragged or aproned. We thank you that they have left their mark upon this earth for you, for us, and for our children and the generations to come, for their faithfulness to the generations. And Father, we thank you for the tremendous sacrifices made by so many that have gone before us, especially these that we listed to you today. I pray that you bless our memories of your saints, God. May we learn how to walk wisely from their examples of faith, dedication, worship, and love of you. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
So if you would, please, as you're able, once again, stand and join me as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Today, not just tomorrow, but right here, right now. 
and how we hope that he will forgive us as we forgive others. And he's concluding this prayer with, I think, the final bit of exhortation that we as his followers need. Lead us not into temptation. Because we all face temptation, right? I mean, it was very tempting for me to get very, very upset yesterday. I mean, when you check the score and it's 55 to 14, God help me. Because the coach sure couldn't. That's <laughs> I said I wasn't going to say anything about the game last night, but anyway. We know that we are all tempted because Christ himself was tempted. In each of the synoptic gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see various times where Jesus was tempted. He went out to the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights where he faced a fasting so that God could speak into his life about who he was and what he was to do. And at the end of these 40 days, it says that the tempter, the devil, as it says in Luke chapter 4, came to him and said, hey, I've got some pretty good stuff to you. So the devil came up to him and said, hey, I have bread to eat because I know that after 40 days that you're hungry. And Jesus said, man can't live on bread alone. Then, Jesus, then the devil came up to him and said, hey, look, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you everything that you can see on this earth. And Jesus said, look, we only worship God. And the devil took him to the highest place in the temple of Jerusalem. So, like, imagine the top of our bell tower, me being up there and jumping off, and angels would come and rescue me. And what does Jesus say? Don't put the Lord your God to the test. Each and every one of us face temptation in this world. And I think one of the ways that we stand against the powers and principalities of the world is we do what Christ did, is he responded over and over again, responding with the word of God. He quoted Satan back the scripture, no, I don't need bread, because I know that bread is more than this life. And so he would stand firm in the word of God. My last year in a seminary, I wrote an 80-page paper over in Ephesians 6, 10-20, where the premise of the whole spiritual warfare comes from in Paul's letter. I can tell you the two most common words in that passage are these two words, to stand firm. And what Paul is wanting for us to do is not to go out and fight evil or the evil one, as oftentimes we talk about, but we are called to stand firm. We put on our shoes and belt and waist cloak, all characteristics of God, faithfulness, righteousness, holiness, salvation, and we armor ourselves against them, and we only have one offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. And the Spirit is the Holy Spirit that comes to us, and so the only thing that's supposed to be used to attack the evil one is not what we have, but the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he's saying these two words, when temptation comes your way, you need to stand firm. And we do so by standing on the Word of God, what God has given us to instruct us and in teaching us. And so what we're praying here in the Lord's Prayer is that we are praying that God will come to our aid during our times of temptation or trial or testing because we acknowledge that we cannot make it on our own. Right? I can't even tell if my battery's on its own sometimes. <laughs> we need God's help. And we need His strength to be able to come overcome the evil one. Because we all face various temptations. I mean, imagine the person that struggles with greed being tempted with a way to make a quick extra hundred dollars, even though it may not be the most moral way to do it. The person that struggles with gluttony living through yesterday and all the Tootsie Rolls that were out there. People that struggle with lust that you can just pull out your phone in the middle of the night and nobody knows what you're doing person that struggles with consumerism and that same poem can take you to Amazon, it'll be here in two days by now. <laughs> Happiness is just a click away, right? You see, the evil one knows which ways we should be tempted. But I stand firmly to the, one of the teachings of John Wesley when John Wesley said, look, it's not God that tempts us. I think some people think, well, God is the one that tempts us and allows you to go through these trials. I don't think that's a Christian belief. That's definitely not a Wesleyan belief. What Wesley said was this. He said, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted evil with, or tempted with evil. 
Neither tempted he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust or desires. What Wesley is saying is what often true in our lives, that the reason we go through various temptations and trials is because my little feet took me there. Is that I see something off shiny in the distance, and I think, hmm, that may not be that bad after all. And I draw a little bit closer to it, and I'm like, well, actually, it's pretty shiny, and it looks pretty nice. What if I messed with that for a little bit? What if I had just one more Tootsie Roll, right? It can't be that bad for you. And then you draw closer and closer and closer to it. And then what Wesley says is that Satan lays that perfect bait, and he snares you like a fish on a hook and reels you in. Oh. Let us not be people that are lured by the devices of the evil one, but are able to stand firm in the word of God to resist the temptation that is placed before us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, you may have noticed when I pray the Lord's Prayer, I pray it in probably a self-righteous, pharisaical way, because I always say the evil one instead of evil. Because most of us say evil, right? Yes, you're still awake? Okay. You're not being tempted to go to sleep? Okay. The reason I say evil one is because the way I understand Greek and the way that people that were smarter than me understand Greek is it is not referring to evil in general, but it's referring specifically to the evil one. The Bible names this evil one in many different names, be it Satan or the devil, the accuser, the slanderer, the father of lies. And we know that there is a source of evil that is out there, this evil one that exists. And Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, he longs for nothing else than to steal, kill, and destroy us. And so we're asking that we don't be led into temptation, but that we are delivered from this evil one, that God will come and... It's much like... Um, this wheat that I have here came all the way from Texas, magically appeared. <laughs> Wasn't quarantined, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> it actually came from some of my church members who were the very first church I served when I was 22, so God bless them for dealing with me at the age of 22. <laughs> And Jesus tells Peter in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan longs to sift you like he sifts wheat. Well, my grandfather was a wheat farmer in West Texas. My uncle still runs the farm right now. And you can walk through wheat fields, and this is a little bit mature, and you can pick the head of it like this. And the way you sift it is you just simply roll it around in your head, in your hand, not in your head. And... It'll start breaking apart, and lo and behold, what you can do with the chaff, the stuff that you don't need anymore, is just... It's not very hard to get rid of the chaff. And he says, Simon, do not be blown away by the evil one with the chaff. But what I want you to do, I actually found a good seed in one of them this morning, is I want you to be like the seed. And when the seed resists in your, resides in your hand, you can blow it, but it's still there. He says, Peter, actually he says Simon because he hadn't changed his name at that point, Simon, allow your faith to be like the seed, so that when the evil one comes and crushes you on all sides, that your faith is able to stand to that test. And whether we like to realize it or not, all of us go through those times of purification and refinement. All of us go through times where the world is pressing in around us and grinding us out to see who we truly are and what we truly have left behind. And I can tell you from my own life and my own experiences, when this happened to me, the things that I came back to were, I am a child of God, a son of the king, a man who was called to preach, to be a husband and a father, and at my very core, that's who I am. And I have this seed of faith that cannot be taken away, that cannot be destroyed, because we know that with God, when we are able to stand firm, that we are able to overcome the evil one. Because with God, all 
things are possible. With God, nothing can overcome us. You see, in Christ Jesus, the hold that Satan so often grips on our lives or the world is broken because we know that through the power of the blood of Christ that he has been driven out, as it says in the Gospel of John in John 12, 31. And that we can come and embrace the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ that's something that can never be broken. As Paul tells us, there is nothing, absolutely nothing in this world that can separate you from the love of God. The bottom line of this prayer is that Satan, the evil one, does not have rule or control or authority over your life because that is surrendered to Christ Jesus through the power of his blood. And that we, at any time, at all times, can go to him to seek to God, to stand firm in the power of his word, and know that we shall not be overcome. That no matter what faces us in this world, that we will stand firm and fight until the end. You see, when we are praying this prayer, we are called to resist the temptation like Joseph. And say, not today. That we are called to be ground down to just the bare seeds of our faith. And let the chafe of this world be gone away. And to know that through the blood of Jesus Christ, that we have victory in Jesus. So church, I want you to know that the end of this prayer is leading us to final victory, the consummation of all things, when we will stand no more, where we know these candles that are lit and burning have conquered and overcome because they have conquered through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. And one day we will join in the chorus of all the saints, remembering who our victory is in. Our victory in Jesus. And we have this victory because of what he has done for us. That one night, he sat with his friends, his disciples, and he took a loaf of bread, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Then as the supper continued, he took a cup of wine, in our case juice, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this often in remembrance of me. And we know that it is through the broken body and the blood that has shed that we stand today as his church faithful, overcoming, triumphant, together with all the saints that have gone before us until we can feast again at his heavenly banquet table. So church, let us be the church that overcomes, that stands in victory with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for our victory in you. How you have sought us and bought us. How you deliver us from temptation and the evil one. And I ask in whatever areas that we may be tempted in right now, that you would allow us to stand firm in the power of your word. Allow your spirit to flow in and through us. And allow us to overcome by the word of your testimony. We ask these things in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so know that during this time, we will be partaking in the Lord's Supper. Um, through our beliefs, we believe that everyone is welcome to partake of his body and his blood. Because of COVID times, um, I will ask a couple of people to come and they will serve you. They will hand you this little cup of juice and bread. If you call this bread... I'm not exactly sure what it is. I think it's manna. It's like, what is this? We're not sure. Um, if you fill off the top clear layer, it's where your bread is at, and your juice is in the second layer. They will come and serve you, so just stay where you are. And if you don't want to serve, be served, just place some next over yourself. And if those that are assisting, please come.
his body and blood given to you, David. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, Victory in Jesus.
And may you follow him all of the days of your life. This day and until we can meet again. Amen? Amen. Amen.